Nothing is an accident. Welcome back to Wizard PhD. I'm Professor Lynette, and today we are going to be talking about everything that we know about Grim Folly. Spoiler alert if you have not completed the Mysteries tab and you don't want to know advanced information, click off this video because everything is going to be based on the clues that are in the mystery tab, as well as some other things that are connected to the outside world. Also, I have some disclaimers of this content. These videos are meant for community. So what that means is that I am not seeking to produce something that's highly polished and perfect and like enough that can't be argued with. So basically the goal is that it's meant to be incomplete, it's meant to have spaces for you to contribute, it's meant to be discussed, it's meant for y'all to talk to each other about it. That's what I'm trying to envision here. What would bring me so much joy is if y'all talked about this game with your Wizards Unite friends. Having face-to-face -face conversations, having conversations online, that's what this is all about, is bringing people together to theorize, to ponder, to think about the world in a deeply complex way, and that's what this is about. My commitment to y'all is to deep dive into source material. That's kind of my thing, that's Wizard PhD. It's about being very um, particular about details, noticing specific things, and making connections. With all of that said, there is plenty in terms of entry points for people to enter into conversations. So if there's something I missed, something incomplete, something that you know from historical context or from the wizarding world, please feel free to chime in when you can. Second disclaimer is just an announcement that, of course, these types of videos will take time in terms of doing research and taking the care and attention that they need. If you're new to this channel, it might also have an intensity that you haven't seen from me before that is deeply serious and thoughtful and hesitant and contradictory, and it's just a whole mess of things. But this is my opportunity to let y'all know what I really think about Wizard PhD. Wizard PhD is for all of us. It's not just me. It's if you want to be thoughtful, if you want to have a deep dive, if you want to study the world and our, yourself and have these observations to be able to create something new with it, that's what Wizard PhD is all about. And all of us can be a Wizard PhD. A key to the success of being a Wizard PhD is to open your mind and heart to possibilities that you may have never even imagined before. It's about the experience on the journey, so let's get into it. It's summer and it's like 5,000 degrees. <laughs> let's get into the Folly family. What we know about the Folly family is that they are listed as a pure blood family in the Sacred 28, but they are not mentioned at all in the Harry Potter series. Traditionally, Follies are sorted into Hufflepuff. We do have a possible modern character named Eustace Folly, who is seen in the Fantastic Beast Cases game. So he might be a student in Hogwarts present day, but I couldn't find a date for that. One of the oldest ancestors we know of in the Folly family is Hector Folly, and he was Minister for Magic from 1925 to 1939, which happens to be the time frame of the Fantastic Beast world. According to short stories from Hogwarts of power, politics, and pesky poltergeist, J.K. Rowling writes, undoubtedly voted in because of his marked difference to McLaird, the previous Minister for Magic, the ebullient and flamboyant folly did not take sufficiently seriously the threat presented to the world wizarding community by Gellert Grindelwald. He paid with his job. So there are speculations that the time period of Grindelwald is mirroring real life. Um, so there was a British minister named Neville Chamberlain, and he also did not take the rise of Hitler seriously um, with a false messaging of everything's good, it's never been better, that sort of thing, like this false sense of security. Quick side note here is that there's only ministers for magic because of the International Statute of Secrecy. So before the Statute of Secrecy was implemented in 1692, there was a wizard's council among other governing bodies, but once the decision was made that an entire wizarding world had to be kept in secret, they needed a way to regulate and communicate, and so the ministry was in turn created in 1707. Other follies that we learn about in this game is Grimm's parents, Lucretia and Marshall. McGonagall tells us that they died during the Second Wizarding War at the Battle of Hogwarts. 
Grimm was also at Hogwarts. He was a student at the time. He was in his second year when Voldemort uh, was attacking the school. And he, unfortunately, being a second year, was sent away uh, because he was too young. So he didn't fight in the battle. His parents did, and they ultimately died. McGonagall leaves us with a little tiny hint of what Grimm's personal baggage might be by stating, I've always feared he had a very personal lesson in the horrors of war. And finally, Grim Folly, who this video is all about, he is the folly that we are most interested in. Grim is suspected to have caused the calamity that we are now tasked to contain. What does Grim look like? Well, looking at a ministry identification card, so this is a clue that we see from the ministry's tab, we have a photograph of Grim Folly. Now, if you zoom in really, really big on your screen, you can see that he has kind of a small frame. He's listed as five foot four inches, 130 pounds, which I don't know why the ministry ID would use American you know, units rather than the metric system, but that's a whole other thing. Hazel eyes blonde brown hair. We do know, based on the context McGonagall told us with the Wizarding War, that Grimm is a few years younger than Harry Potter. He's about 34 years old, millennial, just like most of us watching <laughs> and talking and playing Wizards Unite. And we also know, based on the picture and based on everything else that we've seen, that he's not Tony, AKA the mystery man confoundable that we see in all of our scenes. Also zoomed in on this ministry ID, we can see some insight into Grimm's person. Personality. He is listed as Pisces Sun Leo Moon. This is gonna have to be a different video, but most generally, our sun sign, astrological sign, is kind of like what we typically refer to ourselves as. So I was born October 12th. My sign, my sun is a Libra, that's my sun. Um, and then moon is kind of indicative of personality traits and it's based on where the moon is at the time that you were born so there's lots of stuff with like planetary alignment and energies and stuff that like i really don't know much about but other people do so i promise you we will get more deep into personalities later but there's a lot if you're interested the sun and pisces moon and leo combination seems to be on a perpetual seesaw very caring this personality will surprise everyone with how deeply they can get attached to someone once they have won their attention the personality blends the emotional sensitivity and feelings of pisces with the warmth and assertiveness of Leo. I will put links in the description. There's more that you can read in terms of all of this. Side note though, I think it's really interesting that Hector Folly, the Minister for Magic that we talked about just a second ago, was also described as flamboyant, as JK Rowling wrote in her description. So all of this is really fascinating to me because clearly they are, the people who created this game want us to find details like this. They can choose to put whatever they want on Grimm's ministry ID because it didn't exist before. It's not something that they can just pull from like a movie scene or something that was already designed. So they had to design it themselves and they had to make a choice of how they chose to display a date instead of like an actual number, numeric date, they chose to put it in terms of sun and moon. I think that that is meant for us to go down this rabbit hole. Timeline, so this is, I spent the most time on the timeline uh, because there's all these details and things that you can look up to get within a range. Um, so some things that I have dates for, I will explicitly say. For other things, it's uh, kind of like, I know after this date, sometime after this date this happened, but we don't know exactly when, then I'll be more general with that. Sun in Pisces means Grimm was born sometime between February 19th and March 20th. We also know based on the year he was in school and how Hogwarts, you have to be 11. The cutoff date is September 1st. So he was born in 1985 for him to start at Hogwarts. Um, in the 1996-1997 school year, but his moon is in Leo, so the possibilities for his actual date of birth is either February 4th, February 5th, February 6th, March 4th, or March 5th. One of those five days. Um, I also will note that when I was looking up these dates, and I'll put the link in the description, there is also information on what the moon was for that date. <laughs> and there was a full moon on February 5th. So I'm gonna keep note of full moons because it's an easy marker to keep track of, but you can also connect dates to 
what was happening with the moon. 1996-97, first year at Hogwarts, he's probably a Hufflepuff. I haven't been able to confirm this, but based on the Folly family history, it seems like everyone has been in Hufflepuff. As a student, he excelled in his studies. With his newts, he earned five outstandings and one exceeds expectation. Doing well on your newts is kind of an expectation if you want to work at the ministry. Um, and there are some exceptions, but that's kind of like, you need at least hot five high level newts to be able to be an or, for example. So it's very expected that people who work at the ministry um, do well on these examinations. After Grimm graduated from Hogwarts in 2003, he immediately began working at the ministry and he worked in the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. We find out that he worked under Penelope Paget. There's gonna be a whole episode on Penelope later, don't worry. He was the head research assistant while she was the lead or on a case and they were dark wizards. So that's basically what he did right after graduating. We know that between 2003 and 2006, he dated Penelope. All we know is that during a Christmas party, Grimm told Constance that he and Penelope had been dating for over a year before they had told anyone. So that leaves possibilities for Grimm to have been either immediately dating Penelope, so telling Constance that in the Christmas of 2004, or sometime during the year of 2003 to 2004, like basically right away, he starts dating Penelope. Probably either Christmas 2004 or Christmas 2005 that he told Constance this, but regardless, he started working at the ministry in 2003. So that means that they must have been dating right away. Their relationship seems very instant and also tainted by secrecy. <laughs> so starting off, not even telling anyone that you're together for an entire year, and then basically within three years of meeting Penelope, they, like Grim and Penelope got married. Also, all of these coded love notes and Grimm still writes notes and letters to Penelope in his journal. Like there's so much secrecy that's embedded in this relationship. We get a wedding announcement in the Daily Prophet dated June 2006, Grimm and Penelope are married on a Sunday in West Bromwich and the possibilities for a Sunday in June of 2006, we have June 4th, June 11th, June 18th, and June 25th. And I happen to note it that the full moon was on June 11th, possibility. Between 2006 and 2017, we know that Grimm and Penelope had at least two children. We know their names are Talbot and Melody. One of the coded messages that we see from Penelope to Grimm might be connected to Talbot. I'm being very vague intentionally there because I have not made the decoded video message of that one yet, but it's coming. Also during this decade, Penelope convinces Grimm to apply to be an unspeakable. Uh, at some point, the London Five go missing. We know that Penelope is one of them. And if you look at this screenshot of where we have the Daily Prophet, there might be a possible Easter egg. There's these big letters. You can't read the tiny text, but you can read the big letters. And if you unscramble these big letters, you can make the word named, like naming the London Five. We also know the London Five investigation, who Gareth Greengrass was a member of the council. Harry Potter was like the lead on it or like seen as the figurehead for it was closed and on this image, I can't exactly read the scribble that's on the Daily Prophet corner. So I think it's intentional that this right corner is flipped and that there's like little writing on it, but I can't figure out how it fits. There was an evaluation by Gareth Greengrass that was co-signed by Mordecai Berrycloth. Um, and this recommendation was for Grimm to be promoted to unspeakable in the Department of Mysteries. And going back to Grimm's ministry ID, we see that he gets this when Jupiter is in Scorpio. So this time period is specifically sometime between October 10th, 2017 and November 8th, 2018. This is when Grimm is promoted to unspeakable, sometime in there. Now during this time, there was an issue of the Quibbler with the headline reading, the unspeakables expand in secret, what are they hiding? I don't have any dates for these, so I'm just gonna say them. They're not in a particular order, they're just kind of there. Leading up to June 2019, and probably after Grimm was promoted to unspeakable, he entered the love room several times, as we can see from various logs and comments and notes from people. He requested potion ingredients, specifically baneberry, jabronoff feathers, and unicorn hair. 
He used a port key to visit a library in Prague. He requested to reserve an ancient tome, was denied, appealed it, the appeal was denied. He rescued Eric Munch from the brain room in the Department of Mysteries, where Interestingly enough, the concept of thought is studied in that room. Side note, so unspeakables who work in the Department of Mysteries can work in various avenues. So what's studied in there is um, there's a room for time, a room for love, a room for space, a room for thought, and a room for death. Y'all can look that up and we can go deeper in future episodes. Grimm has a year-end evaluation. So he has been working in his position for at least a year. So it's sometime between October 10th 2018 and I'm saying June 20th, 2019. My guess is the date that the game launched, which the official launch date was June 21st, we got it on June 20th, so whichever one you wanna pick, that day is when the calamity basically was unleashed. That was the quick and not really in-depth overview of who is Grim Folly, what do we know about him. But I am interested in how we can piece this together to understand his motivations. I get this hint of like a forbidden love. Um, I don't have the screenshot, but Constance or somebody saying that uh, Penelope was much older than Grimm. They were people were kind of you know eyeing side eyeing them for their relationship. Also, it seemed to go really fast. So also, I think people had that a little strange perception of the two of them together. I'm not sure how to make sense of their relationship just yet. Is it this? Is it meant to be some romantic like fairy tale whisked away, or is there more suspect? stuff going on behind the scenes. Overall, my perception of Grimm as a person is that he is undergoing a deep transformational growth into his personhood. In all of these little snippets, we can see that he wasn't really confident in himself. He was kind of to the side, not feeling like the hero in his own story. And then we see that change. And so we see the dialogue of people saying, oh, Grimm wasn't like this, like he wouldn't have done that. But I think part of it is because he, Grimm is having his own, you know, he's trying to figure out who he is. He's trying to figure out who he could be if he embraced, you know, his talents, obviously, his gifts and what he can create with that, but people keep underestimating him. Definitely something I can deeply relate to. I mean, he even says, so I've always been the one on the side looking in on everyone else's adventures. Penelope convinces him he has lots to offer. That's how he decides, I'm gonna apply to be an unspeakable, I'm, a, I'm qualified enough. Take that as a quality and think about Grimm's backstory. So he carries baggage from the Second Wizarding War because his parents died. He wasn't able to help out because he was too young. He might harbor some guilt of not being able to contribute or not necessarily being responsible for his parents' death, but like being helpless and not being able to do anything about it. So how the war specifically impacted him is not very clear, but I do think it's foundational to his underlying motivations and his decision making. We have another situation where we're dealing with someone he loves. We're dealing with Penelope, she's gone missing. Now is his chance to step up. He doesn't want to stand idly by that fits in with his whole transformative journey that he's having. And another piece of it is connected to his own story of he doesn't want his children to grow up without a mother like he did. Okay, we had those two things and now let's get into Grimm's personality. So we have that he is very, he finds happiness very difficult without Penelope. So his relationships or his connections to emotions and relationships makes it so that so much is at stake and now that she's disappeared and gone, that's kind of disappeared. His moon Leo is also coming out, his aggression and his, you know, trying to take over chargeness because he feels that the Aurors are not, I mean, they're failing and they're not trying everything, all of the possibilities. He thinks that they are sticking too close to the book and that is frustrating him. And we can see over the course of different dialogues, different memos, that his unconscious moon Leo is coming more into full realization as he becomes more resistant, 
more aggressive um, and more assertive in the ways that he talks to ministry people. I also think that it's possible his Hufflepuff sense of loyalty is being challenged. Grimm is described as Gareth's protege and Penelope was also very close to Gareth. Harry is also an Or, so it's kind of like he, Grimm expects these people who have known him for so long to kind of stand up for him and to be loyal and to, you know, push, yeah, it might be against the rules, but like, wouldn't you do anything to help Penelope? That's kind of the way that his messages are framed. Because of all of this conflict and through the realization of his unconscious Leo self, he decides to take matters into his own hands and just do it by himself. He doesn't tell anyone and he goes on these missions, he does all these things, gathers potions, ingredients, tries to look for an ancient spell, does, tries to put everything together, and then we have the calamity. Overall, the storyline and characters in this game are some of the deepest, deepest questions and mysteries that humanity has tried to study. What this means is that we get to explore various philosophies into what is time, what is love, what is consciousness, how do humans grow and transform, things that people, ancient cultures, storytelling, all these are part of what makes us human. We question, we theorize, we try to understand, and this is how we exist. I'm gonna take this opportunity once again to remind you that nothing is an accident. So I have been on this crazy train. <laughs> People have told me in the past like, oh, you're grasping at straws. I know, I am convinced more than ever, this is not grasping at straws. This is the world, the wizarding world. This is what it is. This is what JK Rowling has always done. She has taken historical, perspectives, knowledges, ideas, and integrated it into her storytelling. What it is that we should be doing is drawing on our own lived experiences, drawing on our own knowledges, and piecing it together. So nothing is an accident, everything is intentional. You can choose, the game designers can choose what they show. They, they chose to focus on cycles of the moon. They chose to connect us to this like astrological personality stuff. All of this is connected. We have time, space, planets. <laughs> we have a mystery and we're trying to figure out what that means for us. Witches and wizards uniting, it's not about a single hero or building up a single hero as a god. It's a different kind of thinking about what it means to be a hero, that everyone is contributing to this massive endeavor of being a person that exists in this world. And what's so exciting is that these are new characters to the wizarding world. So like I said, the Folly family, nobody in the Folly family was mentioned in the Harry Potter series. I mean, we have like more of a context now that we have more writings than just the Harry Potter series. We have the whole Wizarding World collection. So we see glimpses and it's all connected. And so what that means is that we get to piece together all of these clues and be able to figure out this mystery together. That's all I have for you today. I have so, 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 so many theories of what different kinds of directions they could go. I just wanted to give a brief glimpse of Grim Folly, but like I said, I want to focus on other characters like Penelope, I did a Gareth Greengrass video. I have a, a giant theory about ancient magic's role in causing the calamity. I will include all of that um, and I hope more than anything to hear your thoughts. If you notice different things, that's the beautiful thing is I notice particular things and go down these rabbit holes, but every single one of you can go down a rabbit hole and contribute to helping us figure out this giant, giant mystery of the calamity. Stay tuned for more Wizard PhD deep dives and until next time, wands ready.